So in the next uh, in the next 25 minutes, we will have a very special guest, uh, Commissioner uh, Reinders. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, most relevant, and uh, and I hope that you had a little bit of time to maybe look at our study also. You are the Commissioner of Justice, and uh, of course uh, of uh, rule of law and consumer protection. Um, you have also. Uh, really been a leader on putting forward the, the AI uh, proposal. And uh, you will also be the main negotiator for uh, the new, I don't know if it's going to be called Privacy Shield uh, 2.0. Thank you so much for joining us today. No, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and uh, I'm very open to, uh, uh, to discuss with you about all those issues. And it's true that we have had a very busy time in the last days. Uh, with our uh, AU-US relations, but on, on, in my portfolio, of course, it was again an opportunity to discuss about the digital world and certainly the data flows in the digital world. But please. Thank you so much. So um, if you look at uh, the, the, the consequences of a potential disruption of data flows, right? I mean, how do you see the chances of actually finding a best case scenario can we end up in a in a situation where we can find an agreement with the U.S., we can find an agreement on WTO level, and and what's the role of you uh, and of course EU in this uh, in this agenda? But first of all, I want to to express the fact that we have a very clear commitment uh, on different uh, elements. The first one, of course, is to promote and defend some values, and um, you know that uh, we are very. Uh, um, concern about the situation in some part of the world, about the values, but we want to be sure that at the AU level and with a lot of uh, like-minded partners, it must be possible to promote different kind of values and in the digital world to have a real human-centric approach, like you said. So to be sure it's possible to take into account the fundamental rights, the non-discrimination, uh, the protection of the personal data and so on. I don't want to uh, explain all the details, but when we discuss about AI, when we discuss about data flows, we have that in our minds. And I know, to give an example, that with the GDPR, it was possible to have an influence not only in Europe, but more and more in the entire world, and certainly, again, in the like-minded uh, countries, with uh, the introduction of the same kind of the same set of rules in different parts of the world, including at the state level in the US, like in California or in Virginia. That's the first element. The second one, and the second very clear commitment, and I very share the, the views that you have expressed with your study, uh, we want to promote uh, trade and we want to promote an open world if it's possible to have a respect for the values that we, we are sharing. And so uh, is the reason why I'm very committed to, to reach um, a positive uh, agreement, political agreement with the US about the, the ways to organize data flows in the future, not only uh, between the two uh, sides of the, the Atlantic, but also with uh, other partners in the WTO or in other international fora. And what we have seen, to conclude, uh, in the last days uh, was very impressive in the way that uh, the US is back in the multilateral discussion. And that is very important. Of course, we will have different interests. We will defend our interests. The US are defending their interests. But with the new administration, it's again possible to see what kind of possible common approach on climate with the Paris Agreement and some new commitments, but also on AI, on the new technologies or, or uh, data protection or privacy on other issues. Maybe it's not exactly in the same way, but with an intention to uh, promote the values and to promote an open trade. So this is very promising. Just looking at um, the, the specific issue of data flows, right? I mean, I think it's yeah. been a surprise to many that that the data protection boards, they were maybe interpreting it, you know, very strictly. And uh, many might feel that there are actually opportunities within the GDPR to, to transfer data and, and to actually uh, still be in line with... Uh, with with a high court ruling um what your experience with working with with the data protection boards are they do they understand the, the problem and are we moving forward on that uh, front so uh we are now uh three years uh, around three years after the uh, introduction of the gdpr 
we had an, another directive before, but three years is very short if you look to the reality. With many new developments, new technologies and new uh, possibilities in, in different ways in the digital uh, uh, world, and, and you know that with the pandemic, it's more and more true because we have seen more and more activities online. But first of all, uh, when we discuss about data, we need to understand that uh, there are many data out of the GDPR, industrial data, and we will have with the 5G and with many developments, more and more uh, exchange of other data than the personal data that was possible to use in the GAFA for different purposes in the last years. And so going back to the GDPR, uh, I'm working very closely with the um, EDPB, with the board, and with Mrs. Jelinek, the, the, the chairperson of the board, because we try to to have a, a real evolution uh, to a common interpretation in all the member states. Of course, to do that, we need to be sure that all the data protection authorities are fulfilling the requirement of the GDPR and are receiving enough resources to deliver, to do their job. But we try to do that. And uh, just to give one or two examples, we try to explain better what is possible to do uh, to facilitate the life of the SMEs, because there are many possibilities in the GDPR to try to uh, ease uh, the, the, the way to organize a, a full compliance with the GDPR for the SMEs. And we try to do the same, second example, when uh, it's uh, needed to organize transfer to third countries. And you have seen, we have worked very hard with my services in the last uh, months and with the DPB and others to modernize uh, the standard contractual clause. And now we have, again, uh, a tool very efficient and certainly, again, for the SMEs. They don't need to negotiate. They don't need to uh, take new initiative. It's possible to use such a set of clauses in the transfer of data, personal data, with third countries. So we try to work together on this. But of course, uh, when we go further than that, um, the main issue is to be sure that for the individuals in Europe, it's possible to challenge all the decisions taken by the law enforcement authorities or by the intelligence services to have an access to the personal data. And you know that the principle is very clear. Uh, such an access must be proportional and necessary. Uh, if you don't have a necessity to uh, have an access to personal data, you need to protect that. It's the privacy. And so when we discuss with uh, third countries, and certainly uh, you have seen that uh, we have uh, a, a real adequacy decision with Japan, and it's the most important data flows in the world between the EU and Japan. But now we have a, also a a decision about South Korea. So it's possible to reach that. When we discuss with the US, it's in the same way. Is it possible in the US to see an evolution about the privacy? Maybe one day a federal uh, privacy law. We have already some laws at the local level, at the state level. And then how it's possible for the uh, uh, EU citizens to challenge uh, the uh, decision of the authorities in the US about their personal data on individual basis. And that's a, a real discussion. But to answer to your question, I try to, uh, to see if it's possible uh, to have a political agreement this year with the US about uh, the successor of the safe harbor and the privacy shield. And we are very engaged on this because I've had many contacts with the previous administration, but now with the Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, we have had many exchanges, of course, by video in the first phase, but uh, we have had new meetings this week in Brussels uh, during the visit with uh, President Biden, it was possible to have a long discussion with Gina Raimondo again, uh, because I'm the negotiator for the European Union on this. I will go uh, again next week to uh, Lisbon to continue. So we are very committed to go fast. But it's not easy, because to conclude, the real goal that we have is to avoid a Schwem's tree decision. We don't want to have uncertainties. So in the first phase, it must be very important for all the companies to use maybe the standard contractual clauses that we have modernized to have some additional safeguards. And then uh, we are committed on both sides. I've seen that with uh, Mrs. Raimondo. We are committed on both sides to find a way to have a new uh, successor to the safe harbor and the privacy shield, but without the same problem. So with a full compliance uh, with the requirements of the ECG uh, ruling, the decision of the Court of Justice. I'm glad to hear that uh, it seems that we are at the core. Uh, we really hear this uh, government access to data is one of the issues. And also, can you uh, can you challenge decisions of uh, 
of, of data access uh, like you can in Europe. So it seems to be at least narrowed down to the very concrete areas. And even though they are not uh, easy, that we are going in the right direction. And uh, we totally agree here. Uh, rather have a solid uh, framework than having a, a doubtful so, uh, framework. Do you see when we look at... Um, I think the Commission has uh, had done some really successful wor uh, work, as you mentioned, with, with Japan. Um, it has been more like a trial dialogue with industry, the Commission and the Japanese government. Um, do you see the new Tech and Trade Council developing into to kind of with the same model of collaboration on this? I hope so, that we will share uh, some uh, initiatives and we will share some ideas about, again, the protection of the same values when we are speaking about uh, artificial intelligence, to give an example. Of course, it's a very uh, impressive new technology to see new uh, uh, developments in AI, not only the learning machines and other kind of processes, but new and new uh, technologies they have today. And we want to promote those technologies, so there's no doubts about that. But again, we want to be sure that in the use of the new technologies, uh, there is a real possibility to have, again, a human-centric approach. So to be sure that we have the capacity to protect uh, the citizens against uh, any kind of discrimination or any kind of uh, risk for their fundamental rights. And that's the way we have discussed that. And maybe now in the Trade Council, it will be possible to try to solve different issues that we have maybe uh, on the new technologies. But we want to show that on both sides of the Atlantic, there is a real commitment to invest in the research on uh, uh, new technologies, uh, on the capacity to have more and more skills in such a sector, because education is a very important part of the process, to invest also on some instruments. We are speaking about the cloud and the possibility to have also our developments in Europe about the cloud. But at the end, the, the most important element is to, to show that if we want to invest more and more and to develop our own approach about uh, the new technologies, uh, we want also to stay open, if it's possible, to work again with like-minded countries. So with countries trying to, in the same ways or with the same kind of mechanism, to protect the same values. To be concrete, we are knowing that we are not sharing maybe exactly the same values with China, and it was a, a huge discussion in the last days on this, but I'm sure that it must be possible with the US, but with UK, with Australia, with Japan, with South Korea, to try to develop an approach with a full respect for the democratic process, the fundamental rights, and the rule of law. And again, uh, with such a council now, we will uh, uh, share our expertise on this, and we'll see how it's possible, again, not to have exactly the same rules, so it's not the goal, but to, to go in the same direction, a real development of the new technologies, a real capacity also for Europe uh, to be uh, uh, in a good position in uh, the development of those new technologies, but with the same respect for the privacy, for the fundamental rights. And again, uh, in the next years, you will see more and more exchanges of other, dat of other data than the personal data. It's true that we have had maybe in the last decade an experience with uh, many companies collecting personal data, uh, using that, <laughs> making profits, I want just to say, uh, with maybe not so much taxes pay paid in Europe about that, so profits on the use of personal data of European citizens, but at the end, without a real taxation on this. So it's also an issue that we discuss at the international level. But in the future, you will have more and more use of industrial data, and not with the same issue, about the privacy. So uh, that changes also the way to discuss on this. But again, uh, the, the commitment is very clear at the EU level to invest in the, the green transition, to invest in the digital transition, uh, to try to be uh, more in the first row in the research, development, and investment. But again, to, to apply some uh, rules about the protection of the fundamental rights. And what we have done in the GDPR inspire us for the work on the the new uh, legislation on AI, and maybe also on many other ways uh, to develop different processes. And I'm sure that we, we have the same views on this uh, with different partners. And with Japan, to be very concrete, it's very clear that we have seen a, a real progression of the trade due also to a real data flows uh, between Japan and, and Europe. And that's very important because your study is showing that also. If we have a real opportunity to organize 
a good data flows between the different partners that help for the development of the growth, for the development of trade, that help also, I must say, for uh, security issues, because we need also to exchange some information uh, for the security of the citizens about uh, among the, uh, between the different uh, law enforcement authorities or judicial authorities. So it seems uh, I hear really again a political will to to drive this human centric digitalization and, and harmonization of uh, harmonization at least alignment of rule sets for the benefit of uh, of growth and prosperity. So that's very positive. So some might argue that in Europe we have really kind of driven the regulatory, the governance, the protection of the citizens agenda first, but our growth and our innovation hasn't really followed. Uh, we conducted a survey last year that showed that the biggest obstacle for growth of unicorns, where EU only has 5% of the world's unicorns, and, and scaling is really regulatory um, fragmentation in the countries. So now looking at the AI implementation, is there anything that you think we should do differently from, for example, the GDPR uh, implementation? How do you look at, how do we make it less bumpy this time? But it's quite different because it's not exactly the, the, the same process. So I said uh, what we are looking uh, in the development of AI on all sides uh, when we discuss about the values and the fundamental rights is the possible use. So we don't want to uh, uh, put a frame uh, on uh, or to the break on the development of AI. It's very important that we have the possibility to invest in the, the new technologies uh, in different ways. But uh, uh, to, to be very concrete, if you have a facial recognition with a biometric instrument, uh, of course it's very important to do that and to develop that because there are very positive possible use, but there are some risks also. Um, uh, uh, if you have a mass identification in the public space without a real uh, security uh, uh, reason to do that, of course it's become to be very intrusive for the citizens. So what we are trying to uh, regulate is the use of the different new technologies in different specific situations. And of course, uh, uh, we are promoting the development of the technology. So again, it's not the technology as such, the possible problem is the use. And if you have a, a sector with a real risk, of course, you need to take care about the use of technology. Just to give an example, and not to speak all the time about security uh, uh, in, the, in the different uh, uh, member states, but about transportation. If you have more and more possibilities to use AI, to have in the future a car, trucks, maybe train, uh, without any driver, and with the possibility to uh, organize a process just with uh, AI. It's fine, but you need to take care about the security again and the safety of the people on board. So before to put on the road cars without drivers, we need to ask a real documentation about the AI uh, applications that they are using in the way to manage the process to test maybe uh, the AI application and to be sure that there are no problems in the, the way uh, that it was possible to use for collecting, to collect the, the data. And so it's all the time that if we have a sector where there is a risk, healthcare, if you organize uh, different chirurgical operations in the hospital, of course, uh, if you use AI, it's quite important to have real test, documentation, and verification. But the same about the discriminations. We want to be sure that in the way to collect the data, there is no bias, there is no risk for a discrimination due to racism or due to other kind of uh, elements. So again, it's the use that we try to uh, manage and not uh, the development. We are promoting uh, the development of uh, new technologies. And maybe the difference uh, between the GDPR and the way we will organize the market surveillance on AI, it's again the fact that we try to limit the market surveillance where there is a risk in the possible use of some technologies, but not in general. Thank you so much. I have uh, one last question uh, from the audience. It is from Alexan uh, Alexander Alvaro, uh, advisor at EU Affairs. Um, and he is asking, would it make sense to have a GDPR for industrial data? For example, an economic data protection regulation. So would it make sense to make something special for the industrial data? But if you want to do that, it's maybe to protect some development in, uh, in the industry. But I want to say two things about that. First of all, 
uh, you know that we have now a Digital Market uh, Act to open the door for startups and SMEs to take part in the process about the development of new technology. So uh, we, we need to be cautious to don't uh, give an instrument uh, to protect some big players against all the different other actors. So we try to have a more open uh, uh, world uh, in the digital world to be sure that it's possible for new, uh, for incomers, for new uh, actors, SMEs, startups to take part in the process. So. I will be very prudent be, 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 before to put into place uh, some mechanism to protect the industrial data if it's just to block the competition and to don't have a real access for the others. The second element, of course, is that uh, when we discuss about uh, a possible uh, uh, way to do that, we need to organize a real consultation with the business community. So I take note of such a remark, but it will be important to see in the different kind of industries if there is a real need to organize such a kind of protection, because we have some uh, uh, protection about inter intellectual property or other kinds of elements. But is it needed to go further with the protection of industrial data, or is it better to have an open world where it's possible also for SMEs, for startups, to use the industrial data to develop new projects? That's a real uh, other approach than with the personal data. In the personal data, you have a real uh, relation with the fundamental rights. Here it's more an economic problem. So before to take any initiative on this, I'm sure that we need to take care about the, the ways to organize with the D Digital Market Act, a real open digital world for the new uh, actors, and then to organize, and I'm very open to do that, a real consultation in the business community to see if there is a real request to, to de deliver on this. I want just to add one thing, because I know that, and you have mentioned that sometimes it seems to be very bureaucratic to come with a regulation at the EU level and why a new regulation. But you need to think all the time on the possibility to have 27 different regulations. And I want to say that in our discussion with our US uh, counterparts, we have seen that it's more and more uh, also a concern for many businesses in the US. Because if you have a privacy law in California, another one in Virginia in some weeks, discussions in New York, and then slowly in different, you will have maybe 30, 40, I don't know, maybe 50 different uh, legislations and a real fragmentation. So is it better and is it less bureaucratic to have 40 different legislation in the different states or only one at the federal level? In Europe, it's the same. It seems to be all the time a complex regulation, but it's only one. And uh, you need to think about the situation if we continue to work with a fragmentation in all the member states. The GDPR was a good example of this. Of course, it seems to be quite bureaucratic or complicated, but the goal is to have only one mechanism to the entire Europe. And just to give an example, in the last weeks, we have developed, you know, that for the travels uh, in the summer and later for tourism, but for all the activities, not only for tourism, a new certificate. Uh, digital on paper or paper certificate for the entire Europe. If you look to the regulation and to the recommendation, it seems to be complex because there are different elements, but it's only one. And we will use the same certificate to travel in the 27 member states without any uh, uh, other kind of restriction. Think about the same situation with 27 different certificates and different rules in the different member states. It was we have had during a part of the pandemic. So it's, it's what we try to avoid. And that's the same way that we try to uh, uh, proceed about AI, about the personal data. And so before to do something about the uh, uh, economic and industrial data, I'm sure that we need to consult the business community and to take care about the open digital world for new uh, actors and new SMEs or startups trying to, to, to develop new applications. So thank you. We'll look forward to that consultation. And uh, I would say, I mean, Digital Europe is the biggest supporter of doing things one way in Europe. And we do support all we can to make the right uh, proposals coming out of the Commission. Maybe just one advice to everybody who's listening uh, from the member states, please work together to do it in one way when it hits ground, also on GDPR. Uh, so I would uh, like to thank you. Thank you for the great collaboration that we have with you and your openness always to listen. Um, we are looking forward to tap in and to collaborate in the Tech Council in uh, the WTO 
and also always to have a constructive dialogue to, between industry and the commission. Thank you so much for your leadership, uh, Commissioner Randers. With pleasure, and we'll continue to, to organize such a kind of dialogue in the next months and years. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.